Hey kids, welcome to our Anchored VBS. I'm Chaplain Dan and I get the privilege of opening up with music and more these next two days. Hey, what is an anchor? Have you ever heard of that before? An anchor is actually a large metal object that sailors let down from a ship to keep a ship from drifting in the ocean. And when the ocean gets tough and the waves begin to blow, or the wind begins to blow and the waves begin to hit the side of the ship, that anchor, because it's so heavy and so strong, keeps that ship into place. One of the things we're going to learn the next two days is how God keeps us in place in the midst of life's storms. Because of God's faithfulness, we can be kept in place. Hey, boys and girls, would you join me in a word of prayer as we get ready for this VBS? Kids, do me a favor. Take your hands, clap them over your heads, bring them down over your eyes, close your eyes, close your mouth, and bow your head. Let's have sacred time with the Lord. Dear God, I pray that you will be with our music and more and with our anchor VBS. I pray as we sing songs to you, uh, you will be honored that we'll have fun, and that we'll learn about the Word of God and about your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, we get the opportunity to sing a song. So stand up, wiggle your hands out, warm up, because we are going to sing Never Let Go of Me. The words will be in the video, and sing along with the kids at home.
great singing, kids. I am so glad to be here with you today for our Anchored VBS. I'm Miss Melody, and I get to do Bible time with you guys today. Everything at this Anchored VBS is, is going to help us discover that God is faithful. So whenever you hear those words from me, from Chaplain Dan, from one of our other teachers this weekend, if you hear us say, God is faithful, I have a special phrase that I want you to shout out back to us. And wherever I am, I want to be able to hear you. That's how loud I want you to be. Now, don't scream. Don't use an ugly voice. But I want you to shout out nice and strong this phrase. Whenever I say God is faithful, you say trust God. And while you say trust God, I want you to reach up like you're holding on to a rope. Hold on tight. Grab that rope and say trust God. Because God is faithful. Trust, trust God. God. We can trust him no matter what is going on in our lives. God is like that anchor that Chaplain Dan was just talking about. I've got one here with me. Big, strong metal anchor is holding down a ship. God is our anchor. He will keep us safe through life storms. So I want to say it one more time, and I want to hear you answer. God is faithful. Trust, trust God. God. Who are some faithful people in your life? The word faithful means dependable or trustworthy. Can you think of somebody you know that's dependable or trustworthy? It might be your best friend. Maybe you have a friend that is always there for you no matter what's happening, and they are just faithful. They are dependable and trustworthy. I hope your mom and dad, your grandmas and grandpas, their family members there with you are faithful and that you can trust them and depend on them. Maybe you have teachers, neighbors, community helpers, and you can think of someone that is faithful that you can depend on. But of all the faithful people you can think of, the most faithful person is God, right? God is faithful. Trust God. Did, I, did you say it? Did you? I hope you did. God is faithful. One more time. Trust, Trust God. God. Very good. Now, in the Bible, it tells us about God's faithfulness. I have my Bible opened up to 1 Chronicles 16, verse 34. And if you have trouble with that verse, that's a lot of words, remembering where it is, it's on the back of your t-shirt. Did you notice that? I hope you guys all have your anchored VBS t-shirts. If you didn't get one, um, let us know. The chapel does have a few left, so let us know if you'd like to get one of those. On the back of your t-shirt, it has our verse about God's faithfulness. First Chronicles 1634. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. We're going to practice this verse a few times this weekend so you can get it memorized in your heart so you'll know that. But if you forget, it's on the back of your t-shirt. Ask your friend sitting next to you to turn around so you can read it, the words off of their shirt for, the, for you. And let's say it together. I'm going to, and I'm going to teach you some hand motions to go along with it. That I've always found that if we use our hands and our voices and our eyes, it just helps us remember something so much better. So if we're going to say, give thanks to the Lord and move your hands up like we're looking up to God. Give thanks to the Lord, then give me two thumbs up for he is good. Got that part? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And then we're going to give ourselves a big hug and say love, his faithful love and then endures forever. Give me two pointer fingers and kind of make them swirl back toward you forever. His faithful love endures forever, right? So his faithful love and then endures forever. Okay, are you ready to try it with me? First Chronicles 16, 34. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. The motions even helped me as I learned that with you guys. So I hope that verse is starting to stick in your head. We're going to practice it a few more times today and tomorrow, so keep working on it. And if you've got your shirts, color those letters in, and as you color them, it'll help you think about those words too and learning our key verse. Now, because we know that God is faithful, trust, trust God, God, we know that he is always with us and he's on our side. So as we get into our Bible time today, I'm going to tell you a special Bible story about a very interesting shipwreck that happened in the Bible. But first, let's take a break, get our wiggles out a little bit, and let's sing one more song together called God is For Me, because we know that God is on our side. He's always with us and always there to take care of us.
today, we're going to learn about a man named Paul. Maybe you've heard about this Bible character before. His story is in the New Testament in the book of Acts. And that's what I've got open here in front of me. But the part of our story is towards the end of Paul's life. So I want to back up really quick and tell you a little bit about who he is and how he got to this shipwreck. Paul's original name was Saul. God gave him the name Paul at one point in his life, but first he was Saul. And when he was Saul, he was a leader of the Jewish people, and he did not like the Christians. Um, a lot of the leaders at the time, they thought the Christians were liars. They thought they were fakes. They did not believe in Jesus. They thought Jesus was somebody pretending to be God, and it made them pretty angry. So Saul was part of a group of people that went around persecuting Christians. Persecuting, that meant he looked for Christians wherever they were. He arrested them. He put them in jail, and he even killed Christians. That was what he did, and he thought he was doing it to serve God because he thought the Christians were following somebody who had been lying about being the true God. So he wanted to protect God and serve God by getting rid of all of these Christians. And one day, as he was traveling with a group of his soldiers looking for some Christians, he was heading towards a city called Damascus, and suddenly there was a bright light from the heavens. It blinded him. It knocked him off his donkey. He fell to the ground and a voice from heaven said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul immediately knew whose voice that was. He knew it was the voice of Jesus and that Jesus really was God. So Saul's life at that point completely turned around. He realized that what he had been doing was wrong and that Jesus really was God. And instead of going out to find Christians and persecute them, he began teaching Christians about Jesus and about God. And he traveled around the whole world. He was the first missionary from the early church. He made at least four different big missionary trips. He traveled around and started churches at cities all through the Roman Empire, the known world at the time. And the problem was there were still people that were persecuting Christians. And so now Saul, who God changed his name to Paul, was on the wrong side of this persecution. Now there was people trying to persecute him. Many times he was arrested for teaching about Jesus. Many times he was put in jail. And finally, towards the end of his life, he said, well, I am a Roman citizen. I live in this Roman empire and I want to appeal my case to the emperor. He said, I'm not going to stay in prison in these little towns anymore. Take me to the emperor. And so that's what they had to do back then. If someone was a Roman citizen, they could appeal their case to the emperor. So Paul did that. They put him on a ship with a bunch of other prisoners and sailed to Rome. Now, they had to sail across the Mediterranean Sea. It was a pretty long voyage. And the Bible tells us in Acts 27 that the wind was not favorable. It says the wind did not allow us to hold to our course. So back then, ships, they had anchors like this one, like our ships do today, but they didn't have engines or motors. They had sails. So if the wind wasn't favorable, they didn't have much to do except sit and wait, wait for the wind to change. They could kind of adjust the sails a little bit, but they really just had to wait for the wind. 
And while they were doing that, um, God spoke to Paul and told him something. He said, men, he told the rest of the crew, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and the cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, that was the soldier who was guarding the prisoners, did not listen to Paul. They listened to the pilot and the owner of the ship, the captain, and they decided to keep sailing. So Paul warned them from God that they really shouldn't keep sailing. This was not going to be safe. And it says a gentle south wind began to blow. They thought they got what they wanted. They were excited. The gentle south wind was blowing. The ship could move. And they said, oh, Paul, he's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We've got just the right wind to sail with. But before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. Now, those of you who live here on JBMDL, we had a bit of a hurricane this week. A little bit of leftover tropical storm came through. That was a lot of wind, wasn't it? Would you want to be on a ship in the middle of the sea during a storm like that? I sure wouldn't. That would be the waves crashing and lightning and thunder and wind and these men on this ship were sailors. The captain had been on the sea so much he knew how to, he wasn't new to the sea, but even he was scared. They passed an island. They couldn't even make the lifeboat secure. It said they were afraid they were going to run aground on the sandbars. They lowered the sea anchor, but the ship was still driven along. So the anchor wasn't even strong enough to hold the ship in place. It was still tossing on the sea. That, that's how bad the storm was. And we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. So that to make the ship lighter, so it wouldn't be so heavy in the sea, they began to throw over all the cargo. So all the things that they were going to sell and trade when they got to Rome, that wasn't important because they wanted to save their lives. The stuff was not as important. So they began to throw over all of the cargo. It says on the third day, so three days had gone of this crazy storm at sea, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. So all the extra parts of the ship that not really necessary to keep the ship afloat, all the extra rigging for the sails, the pieces of metal and things, anything they could get rid of to make the ship lighter, they threw it overboard. It said neither sun or stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. So what Paul had said was coming true. He said there was going to be a storm and they shouldn't have sailed. But this is what's happening. It says, after the men had gone a long time without food, so they've already eaten all their food, they'd thrown all the extra food overboard to keep the ship sailing, Paul again stood up and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete when you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Like, you should have listened to me. But I urge you now, keep up your courage. Not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Wow, could the ship be destroyed and all of the men on the ship live? That would be pretty difficult to do. They didn't have fancy lifeboats back then like we do now. They didn't have helicopters to come in and rescue them. If a ship sank, usually the people on the ship would die with it. But Paul promised, he says, last night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me. He says, I'm one of God's people. And I serve God, and God sent an angel to talk to me last night. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you all the lives of those who sail with you. The angel told me, no, Paul, you're going to live. You're going to get to go see Caesar. Like, God has promised you this, and God is also going to keep every life that's with you on this ship alive, too. So keep up your courage, men. I have faith in God. Oh, Paul knew something that we know, right? He knew that God is faithful. Are you, did you say it? Trust, Trust God. God. Yes, Paul knew this, that God was faithful. He says, nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So, so the ship is going to be destroyed. We're going to run aground, destroy the ship, but we all will live. So on the 14th night, we were still being driven across the sea. 14 days of this hurricane storm. About midnight, the sailors sensed we were approaching land. They took surroundings of the water. It was about 120 feet deep. Short time later, they checked again. Now it's only 90 feet deep. They're getting closer to sea. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. They were afraid the ship would be thrown against the rocks. It'd be smashed. They all, if you get thrown off a ship into a bunch of rocks, it would probably really hurt. So they threw down four anchors to keep the ship steady. They were praying for daylight. Some sailors let down the lifeboat. 
pretending they were going to lower some anchors. Oh, they're being sneaky. They were trying to escape. But Paul said, unless all the men stay on the ship, we won't all be saved. That was God's condition. So the sailors cut the rope. They dropped the lifeboat. They said, okay, we're going to trust Paul this time because he was the one that was right. Let's all stay on the ship. Just before dawn, Paul urged them to eat. For the last 14 days, you have been in constant suspense and you have gone without food and you haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you, take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. And after this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God. He broke it and he began to eat. So he prayed for his lunch and started eating right in the middle of the storm. Doesn't Paul sound like he really trusted God? He was calm in the midst of this 14 day hurricane on the sea. So everyone was encouraged. They all ate some food for themselves. There was 276 of us on board. This is a pretty big ship. When they, everyone had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the rest of the grain into the sea. And when daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach and they could run the ship aground into the sand. That would be better. So they cut loose the anchors. They left them at sea. They just cut the anchors off, left the anchors in the ocean and the ship was pushed towards the sea. They hoisted the foresail, made for the beach, the ship struck a sandbar, ran aground, the, the bow of the ship, the front stuck fast, it would not move, and it was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. So when the boat got stuck in the sand, the waves smashed the boat. The, sail, the soldiers now, this is interesting, they planned to kill the prisoners to prevent them from escaping. Because the Roman soldiers, if they, the law was at the time, if a soldier was guarding a prisoner and he lost that prisoner, the soldier would have to die in the prisoner's place. So the soldiers were thinking, huh, these prisoners are going to escape if we let them out. So let's just kill them right now so we won't have to answer for it later. But that was not part of Paul's plan. Remember, God said every person on that ship would, be, would live. So it says the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life, so he kept them from carrying out that plan. The centurion was the one in charge of the soldiers. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first to get to land. And the rest were they to get there on planks or pieces of the ship. So all the pieces of the ship that were broken, grab a board and float to land. And it says, in this, everyone reached land in safety. Wasn't that a really exciting story? Did you know that there was stories that exciting in the Bible? If you didn't, well, I'm going to let you know there are, and there's a lot more. So get your Bible out, find Acts chapter 27, and read that again for yourself if you'd like to. Because that was just Wow, 14-day hurricane storm, the ship was destroyed, everyone thought they were going to die. But God had made a promise to Paul, and it says, everyone reached land safely. So all 276 people that were on that ship during that storm, they were shipwrecked with Paul, they all made it safely. And after Paul landed on the island, another ship eventually came and took him on to Caesar, where he was able to present his case before the emperor of all of Rome, and he was able to teach about Jesus in the capital and even to the emperor. So God had a special job for Paul. He wasn't done with Paul yet. Paul was not going to die on that shipwreck. God is faithful, right? Trust, Trust God. God. All right, boys and girls, thank you for joining me today for Bible Time. For the rest of our VBS, we have a special craft coming up with Miss Selena. We've got games with Miss Cassie, and we'll be back together for a Coral Reef closing with Chaplain Dan. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Selena and I'm going to do VBS crafts with you. Our first craft is our balloon octopus. So go ahead and get these things out. First, get your balloon. Blow it up. Tie it. Next, you're going to get your glue dots. These are pretty cool. They kind of save the day. Put the glue dot on the back of the eye one of your googly eyes and place it on your balloon and get the next googly eye place the glue dot on it and put it on your balloon next 
we have how many pipe cleaners? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We kind of have a rainbow assortment here. So you're going to take them, put them together, and twist them at the top. Twist your pipe cleaners at the top. That looks great. I love these colors. Next, take your balloon. And at the mouth of your balloon, you're going to wrap your pipe cleaners around the mouth of the balloon. Why do we have eight pipe cleaners? Because an octopus has eight legs. And there you go. Next, you can twirl the legs. Make it really curly. Just twist them, bend them, make them fun. What are we missing on this octopus? Maybe, maybe he needs a mouth. Let's try to give him a mouth. Be careful, these pipe cleaners have wire in them and it could possibly pop your balloon. I had that happen to me. Make a little mouth. And there you have it. Your balloon octopus. I think I'll call him Omar. Omar the octopus. Okay, so our second craft, our second craft today is our silly turtle. Get your crayons out and pick your favorite colors and color your shell. You can design it any way you like. You can use markers if you have markers. My purple didn't go to the end. Try to get all the white spaces. Make them all nice and colorful. Make them all nice and colorful. going to get your foam and there's a pattern already on here you're going to cut out your turtle get your scissors um, cut out your turtle Don't worry if you, you don't get it perfect, it's fine. Okay. So, your turtle is cut out. The next thing you need to do you're going to place your shell on your turtle. You'll see it lays pretty much perfectly on your turtle here. You're going to put, take your glue dots and just put four glue dots. One, two, three, and four. 
near turtle. Hopefully I got them all in the right spot. And then place your shell on top. You need to add some more you can so that your turtle, your shell is sticking to the turtle. Next, you're going to take your googly eyes and your glue stick. You're going to take your googly eyes and your glue stick. Put some glue on here. The second eye. And there you have it. Let me get this extra glue off. Maybe it's not extra. better. And now you have your Shelly turtle. Well, I'll call it Shelly after my sister-in-law. Silly Shelly turtle. Hello everyone. Welcome to Anchors Away Play. I'm Cassie and I get to be your game director for VBS this year. We are learning about Paul and how he was shipwrecked. So today, we are going to play a game called Shipwreck. I know there are many different ways of playing this game, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna play it the way I am used to playing it. I will give you instructions and we will get to do some fun, active play to act out what a shipwreck might look like. Now let's... Here's how we begin. Let's find a nice open space on your floor where you can run around and move safely. So clear out toys. If you're outside, make sure you have an area that you can run without running into something. To begin shipwreck, I will give you directions. North is behind me. South is in front of me. East and west. As I say these directions, you get to run in whichever direction I have called until I say shipwreck. And then you hit the deck. Make sure you touch the ground. Or if you're in your house, you can even lay on the carpet. So, are you ready to begin? North. <laughs> South. <laughs> West. South. Shipwreck. Great job. Go ahead and stand up. We're going to try it again. Ready? West. Wait. South. North. West. Very good. All right. One more time. On your feet. East. South. North. West. North. Shipwreck. Well done. You can rewind this video and watch it again to play some more or have a parent call out directions for you. Thank you so much for playing with me today and I will see you again tomorrow for more games. Welcome back kids to our Coral Reef Closing. Hey, let's start by singing a song. Let's sing God Is For Me.
keep this one thing on my mind The maker of all the universe is on my side And this God is for me Who can be, who can be against me? God is for me Who can be, who can be against me? He is my strength, He is my friend forever God is for me Who can be, who can be against me? faithful trust god i don't know if i caught you off guard but be listening for that whenever i say those key words almost got you at home didn't i god is faithful trust god good job kids well anyways let's keep moving through our story this or through our closing program this morning you know you can trust god no matter what's going on in your life have you ever been really dizzy before Maybe you spun around or even got on a boat and got seasick. Now, I know most of the time we're talking about what's under the sea during our VBS. But sometimes people travel in a ship on top of the sea, don't they? And when they do that, you can get something called seasickness. You know that doctors and scientists have discovered that, they, that there is a way to help with seasickness by looking out at the horizon where the steady sky meets the steady ground. They've realized that that can help you feel a little bit better and helps remedy the seasickness. You know what? Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt maybe not physically sick, but emotionally sick, scared, dizzy, maybe out of place? I know for my family, Whenever we have to move to a new station, sometimes for my kids, that's one of the problems that they face. Moving to a new base or a new town, it can be scary. It can make you feel a little bit out of place. Tonight, today, we are going to learn from someone by the name of Dominic. And we have a short video called Dominic's Story. I hope you learn about how God's faithfulness can help you through hard times. My name is Dominic and I'm almost 11 years old. Dominic lives with his mom, dad, grandma and grandpa. He enjoys all kinds of hobbies, but one is his favorite. I like to build things. I also like karate a lot. I love karate because 
I get to really express myself and I get to have fun. And I also get to build character and build physical strength. Learning karate is hard work. Dominic practices up to three times a week. Plus, he practices at home with his dad. The hardest thing about karate is definitely a lot of push-ups, leg lifts, sit-ups. Dominic knows he needs to trust in God's faithfulness when things get hard. There was this board breaking thing and I saw all the other kids break it with their palm right here, right here. Boom. Just didn't work out for me. Dominic failed to break the board with his hand, but he didn't give up. He faithfully practiced and asked God to help him. And I said, I'm going to break this board. It's an obstacle way, way, and let me push through it. And ha! I broke it. Another part of karate is taking tests to earn new belts. Each belt color represents a new level. Earning a new belt is hard. I was very discouraged on the first day because I was afraid I wasn't gonna pass and that's what brought me down. The second day, I was feeling very, very discouraged, very, very, very sad. And I thought, I don't think I'm gonna pass this and I didn't. I failed and I failed and I failed. Finally got to the last day that I could possibly test and I said, this isn't gonna be like those last times. I am going to pass it. I said, you know what, Jesus, Jesus can help me get through this. I'm just gonna pray to him today. I am gonna pass the test tomorrow. And I did. In the Bible, in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 34, it says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. My three-day test, it was really hard. And Jesus helped me through that. I was nervous for it. If you're going through hard things, I suggest that all you need to do is just trust in God and he'll help you. Pray to God and he can get you through anything. God is faithful. Wasn't that a neat video, kids? How did God's faithfulness help Dominic through his life? Maybe you want to answer among yourselves at home. Here's another question for you. Why is God so faithful to us? Kids, whenever you feel wobbly or uncertain or unstable, it's always good to remember our verse that we're learning. Give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. At this time, we have a chance to sing another awesome song. Let's stand up together and sing, Never Let Go.
kids at home, if you want to replay the video so the kids get a chance to learn the song, feel free to do so. Hey, it's been a great first day here at VBS. I hope you've had a great time. And remember, God is faithful. Trust, Trust God. God. At this time, we're going to close in prayer, and, and hopefully we'll see you back again tomorrow. Let's pray. Take your hands, clap over your heads, bring them down over your eyes, close your eyes. Close your mouth and bow your heads. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you be with our second day of VBS. And I pray, Lord, that we will remember that you are faithful and that we should trust you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day and we hope to see you again tomorrow.